Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about oxidation reactions that make aldehydes and ketones. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems that I assigned last lecture. So in this first problem, we have this keto ester, and we treat it with some sort of reducing agent, and we get this hydroxyester product. Now the key step here is knowing whether or not your reducing agent will reduce your ester or your ketone. And so in this case, we're going to choose sodium borohydride because typically sodium borohydride will only reduce ketones and aldehydes. Now, occasionally you'll see sodium borohydride reducing esters, but ketones tend to be much more electrophilic and they react much faster. Additionally, this alkene is so far away that we don't have to worry about any conjugate addition type thing happening because this is not a conjugated alkene. In the next problem, I ask what the proposed product of the following reaction would be. So there's a number of functional groups, and even though we were mainly talking about the reduction of carbonyls in last episode, it's important to know that LAH both reduces all carbonyl compounds, including esters, as well as halides. So in this case, the benzyl bromide would be reduced to just like a benzyl hydrogen. So this becomes a toluene instead of a benzyl halide. And then the ester group gets reduced to an alcohol. The methyl ether and the tetrahydrofuran ring would both be well tolerated. Now, in the next problem, I asked which reducing agent should be chosen for the following transformation. And so, as I was just saying, lithium aluminum hydride can reduce any carbonyl compound. However, lithium aluminum hydride will also reduce halides, it will also reduce nitro groups and epoxides. And because our product still has this bromide, the nitro group, and the epoxide, while the alcohol was reduced, it's important that we would choose sodium borohydride for this transformation, just so that none of our other sensitive functional groups would be uh, touched. And so with that, let's get to today's material. While last time we were talking about the, the reduction of carbonyl compounds to alcohols, today we're going to talk about the reverse reaction, where we convert alcohols into aldehydes and ketones. So one trick I wanted to mention at the beginning of this is it's hard to do a partial reduction of an ester to an aldehyde. You can take an ester and treat it with something like dibol, diisobutyl aluminum hydride, as well as some other conditions, and you can occasionally get the aldehyde this way, but usually those reactions, if you leave them too long, they will keep reducing the aldehyde to the alcohol. So one trick that people use that makes chemistry a little bit more manageable is to just over reduce it, except that it's gonna to go to the alcohol. So use LAH, convert your ester to an alcohol, and then use a mild oxidant that will convert that alcohol back up to an aldehyde. So uh, there's various reasons uh, that you do this, the main one being it's hard to stop at uh, partial reduction to an aldehyde. Aldehydes tend to be very reactive. As we've discussed in many episodes so far, a lot of the chemistry that we've talked about involves aldehydes because they're excellent electrophiles. So it's important to choose for this transformation some sort of oxidant that will stop at the aldehyde and won't continue oxidizing to the carboxylic acid. So there's three main methods that people use. The first one is a reagent called desmartin periodinane. This is actually misspelled, there should be an I here. In the next example, we have pyridinium chlorochromate, PCC, and finally, the Swern oxidation. And there's several other named reactions that are like the Swern oxidation. They just use different conditions to generate the Swern reagent. So some of those related reactions include Cori Kim oxidation, Fitzner Mofat oxidation, Peric Doring oxidation, and Albright Goldman oxidation. There are a couple other methods that you occasionally see used. These are commonly seen in total synthesis. That includes lay oxidation, which uses TPAP uh, and ruthenium-based uh, oxidant, as well as like uh, something to regenerate the oxidant because it's a catalytic ruthenium oxidation. And the final method is a tempo hypochlorite oxidation. And so while I've listed these here, we're really just going to focus on the main three types of oxidations. And so as you can see here, we have an alcohol. It's treated with some sort of oxidant, and it's converted to an aldehyde. Now, even though for the most part, I'm going to be talking about the reduction or the oxidation of primary alcohols to aldehydes, all of this chemistry also applies to ketones. But because aldehydes tend to be more sensitive, this is where these methods see the most use. Oftentimes, they're used to prepare ketones as well because they're convenient and mild, but aldehydes are the precious material that people are really concerned about making. So first, let's talk about the DMP oxidation. I would argue that this is likely the most mild method for accessing aldehydes, which is why it's so popular to use. This is the structure of desmartin periodinane, and you can see it's an iodine-5 hypervalent iodine reagent. And so this will just oxidize, convert this to two equivalents of acetic acid, and you'll get your aldehyde or your ketone product. 
the only other functional groups that tend to react with desmartin priodonane when you're using it in its pure form will be oxymes such as like derived of aldehydes or ketones. Those will just get converted to their carbonyl counterparts. Um, it's also worth noting that if you have a benzylic or an allylic alcohol, these will react faster than your typical aliphatic alcohols. So if you have another benzylic or allylic uh, group in your molecule, those alcohols will tend to react faster than other ones. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the benzylic and allylic alcohols are particularly problematic for over-oxidizing from other oxidants. So this is another reason why this is a really useful reagent, because it's very well behaved. However, one reason some people don't like using DMP is sometimes the stuff that you get commercially is somewhat unreactive, or it doesn't dissolve in dichloromethane like it's supposed to. And this is because sometimes during the production of it or the handling of it, it's been partially hydrolyzed. It can decompose to IBX, which is actually one of the intermediates to make uh, desmartin priodinane, um, or other related iodanes. And so sometimes if you just recrystallize it with a bit of acetic anhydride, you can convert any of the partially hydrolyzed product back into DMP. Um, you can also make it yourself from scratch if you'd like, and the prep of IBX has been well established through several different routes. So the mechanism of this transformation is first, the alcohol will displace one of the acetate groups. Um, when this happens, uh, an acetic acid molecule is liberated, but this proton can be exchanged throughout so that we have another open acetate that's able to be nucleophilic. Oftentimes these reactions are done with a little bit of sodium bicarbonate to help this step occur. Next, the acetate is able to abstract one of the hydrogens, which donates its electron density into the carbon single bond oxygen bond. And when this occurs, this also reduces the iodine 5 to an iodine 3. And so you can see the, the blue electron pair here is representing that that oxygen iodine bond has just donated its electron density into the iodine, reducing the iodine. When this occurred, though, it oxidized this carbon center from a, from a tetrahedral to an sp2 hybridized uh, CO bond. And so overall, we've produced two equivalents of acetic acid. And as I was saying before, typically a little bit of base such as sodium bicarbonate is employed for this, but not always. So one example from the literature is the oxidation of this epoxy alcohol, where DMP does not touch the epoxide, it only oxidizes the alcohol to an aldehyde. And it only takes 20 minutes at room temperature. Another example is this complex derivative here. This is a fumarate derivative. DMP is able to not touch this Michael acceptor. It doesn't touch any of the other groups. It only oxidizes the alcohol to an aldehyde. And so this is quite an impressive transformation, especially given how reactive alpha beta unsaturated esters are. One final example that's quite impressive is this polyene alcohol ketone containing compound, which all of these very sensitive functional groups are just totally well tolerated. And after only one hour at room temperature, we're able to get 95% conversion to this diketone product. This is quite an impressive transformation that really highlights the utility of DMP as an oxidant. So after that, now let's talk about PCC oxidation. So the one downside about PCC is it generates chromium waste. Here you can see that PCC, it's just a pyridinium complex of chlorochromic acid. Chlorochromic acid is a chromium-6 reagent. Chromium-6 reagents tend to be particularly carcinogenic as well as just generally toxic. And so the one downside is even though these are really good, convenient reagents to use, you have to deal with that waste afterwards. And oftentimes in research laboratories, Students tend to mix their chromium wastes with other wastes, which can upset many lab members and create safety hazards, uh, as well as, uh, let's just say, hazards with the university checking what you're doing and making sure that you dispose of things properly, which uh, can make doing research more challenging. So as long as the solutions are dry when you use PCC, you'll tend to only stop at the aldehyde. However, if you do a wet solution, you'll start forming chromic acid, and that can start doing something called a Jones oxidation, which can sometimes afford carboxylic acids. So it's important that your reagents are dry, and this is done usually in dry anhydrous dichloromethane. So here, the mechanism of this reaction is the alcohol is able to attack the chromium-6 center, displacing a chloride. The chloride is then able to abstract one of the hydrogens from the alcohol, which is now bound to the chromium. This CH donates its electron density into the CO bond, and the the O chromium bond is able to donate its electron density into the chromium center, reducing the chromium from a chromium six species to a chromium four species. And in so doing, we eliminate hydrochloric acid and we form our aldehyde. 
So a couple examples from the literature include the oxidation of this cyclopropane containing alcohol. Here you can see this is cleanly converted to the aldehyde in the presence of various nitrogen containing functional groups. Another example is the treatment of this triether uh, allylic alcohol, which is converted to the, uh, the alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde very cleanly 30 minutes at room temperature, although in somewhat low conversion. Now let's talk about the Swern oxidation. So here I haven't drawn the, drawn the general reaction scheme on its own because first it's important to understand what everything is doing in this reaction. This is the type of question you often see in an organic chemistry exam because it's a very clever way to check whether or not you understand something called a sigmatropic rearrangement. Quite often, if you look in textbooks, this mechanism can sometimes be drawn incorrectly. So the second half of this mechanism is one that you want to pay particularly close attention to. So first, DMSO is able to act as a nucleophile at oxygen and attack oxalyl chloride. This 1,2-diacyl chloride is called oxalyl chloride. Oxalyl chloride is then able to eliminate a chloride, forming this sulfonium ester species. The chlorine is then uh, able to act as a nucleophile and attack at the sulfonium, displacing the oxygen onto the oxalyl group, which then converts to carbon dioxide, as shown here, carbon monoxide, as well as another equivalent of chloride, which will stick around the chlorosulfonium so that they can uh, neutralize each other out. So this is the active Swern reagent. And we were mentioning other methods of doing a Swern oxidation that were go, that go by other various named reactions. Those typically produce either a chlorosulfonium or other related sulfoniums that are used in the subsequent step. So in this case, here we have an alcohol attacking at the chlorosulfonium, eliminating hydrochloric acid. Then triethylamine is able to act as a base and deprotonate the proton of the sulfonium. And so this is really important. This is the part where you can lose marks on an exam, and oftentimes uh, in textbooks this mechanism is drawn incorrectly. Sometimes people will show the protons of the alcohol being deprotonated, but that's incorrect. There's been very strong mechanistic studies done uh, on the Swern oxidation mechanism, and it always goes through this mechanism. So triethylamine deprotonates this. This is an acidic proton because it's adjacent to a sulfur which is positively charged. You can draw this as a positive charge next to a negative charge, but some people draw this as a sulfur double bond carbon. Both are acceptable. So then what happens is what's called a sigmatropic rearrangement. And this is the first time we've talked about sigmatropic rearrangements in this lecture series so far. And so here, this sulfur double bond carbon is able to donate electrons towards that hydrogen over there. The carbon hydrogen bond donates electrons into the carbon oxygen bond. And the oxygen-sulfur bond uh, is able to reduce the sulfur from a sulfur 3 plus species, which is shown as here, to a sulfur 2 species. And so overall, the reduction has occurred. You can see the red electrons have been converted into an electron lone pair. And the hydrogen from the alcohol has been transferred to the DMSO, which is now dimethyl sulfide. So this is one reason you might not want to do uh, Swern oxidation, because it produces dimethyl sulfide which smells like rotting broccoli or cabbage. And oftentimes when I've worked in research labs, I have usually had to work in a completely separate fume hood away from the rest of the lab when doing Swern oxidations. And historically, Swern oxidations were so commonly done that people had a dedicated fume hood just for these, including its own separate roto evaporator because the dimethyl sulfide is just so bad. You can smell it in like parts per billion or parts per trillion, and it's an extremely unpleasant smell for most people. So this is the Swern oxidation. Some examples of the Swern oxidation include the oxidation of this heterocyclic uh, protected compound, where you can see this hydroxy group is cleanly converted to an aldehyde group. Now the way this is done is, like technically speaking, is as I was just laying out. First, the DMSO reacts with oxalyl chloride and triethylamine at very low temperatures. Then the alcohol is added in. Also, you usually add in the triethylamine after mixing the DMSO and oxalyl chloride in DCM. Um, you can add it sooner, but it could lead to some side reactions. So typically this is added right before the alcohol is added. But the alcohol has to be added in afterwards. If you do this all together, the oxalyl chloride itself might go and react with parts of your molecule because it's a good electrophile, and you so you just want to avoid that. You want to prep your sulfonium first. And then gradually this is warmed from a really low temperature to a slightly higher, but still very low temperature so that none of the sulfonium is able to decompose. We'll just go back for a moment here. I want to emphasize that this chlorosulfonium is a very unstable compound. 
and if you heat it up, it can often lead to detonations. Even though there's chemical transformations where this is able to be converted to chloromethyl methyl sulfide, under most conditions, this will just like explode. And I have had negative experiences with this personally. Uh, don't try and isolate chlorosulfoniums. Another example of a Swern oxidation is the conversion of this acetonide protected hydroxyester, which undergoes a Swern oxidation affording this aldehyde. Now, most of the time in the literature, when you see Swern oxidation listed, it's this exact set of conditions. From this reference shown here, this exact set of conditions is usually what works best. Sometimes people will deviate from it, but most of the time it works so consistently that people just call it the Swern oxidation because it works almost every time. And so with that, I'd like to assign a few practice problems. First, taking this triol and treating it with DMP, what kind of product will you make? Additionally, what type of alcohols typically will react with desmartin periodinine? The next problem is taking DMSO, treating it with acetic anhydride, what type of product does this form? It's a little bit similar to a sworn oxidation, but this is a different activator than oxalyl chloride. And so I just want to emphasize here that you can produce the sulfonium using different methods. And so with that, I hope this has been a really useful lecture on the oxidation of primary and secondary alcohols affording aldehydes and ketones. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Have a great day.